messages I'm not seeing in Euro. Let me see. Hold. Now, welcome to my presentation. Uh, I have to say that the name is something that I just, just showed up in my mind when Bartos asked me to think about the topic to present. Um, the first idea was, okay, I would like to present something that is related to what I am currently doing in my work. Yes. And I am doing so many things that I had to look for some kind of root of my, my current work. And that's why I thought, okay, I'm doing clinical behavior analysis. So I will talk about this. And, but I also know that sometimes we need something more catchy as a title. So I think, okay, it's, it's, what is clinical behavior analysis for me? And I had this image of uh, back to the future. I don't know if you watched the film, but I think, okay, well, there is something temporal about clinical behavior analysis because it's something that is with us since many years ago. And also it's something really present in what I am seeing in the contextual behavioral science community. And I think, and that is my idea, it will be something that will um, get stronger in the future. Yes, but it's just my idea. It's always maybe what I would like to uh, happen. So my presentation is called Back to the Future, Clinical Behavior Analysis as an Approach to Understand and Treat, treat Human Suffering. I'm not sure if uh, among participants, we have many behavioral analyst, analysts. Um, I have to say that in my country, it's not a really well-known tradition. In fact, to, to whom uh, is like, thinking what is the most well-known approach uh, in psych psychotherapy in our country is still psychoanalysis, uh, I, I guess. And sadly, because Argentina has been a country that where psychoanalysis has, has been the more important uh, approach in psychotherapy. We are really working hard to change that. And I think we made many good steps. In fact, we are every year more uh, contextual behavioral psychotherapists. We have a, a chapter of the ACBS. In fact, I am the current president of the ACBS Argentinian chapter, but I, I'm sure we have to keep on working a lot. So talking about clinical behavioral analysis in our country is not something really usual. In fact, we are more used to listening presentation about ACT, about FAP, but not specifically about clinical behavioral analysis. So it is a challenge for me and I like challenge. So let's start with the presentation. Well, I, I really like, oh, I, I decided to start with this slide because it was really fun for me to read that. So I, I think Bartos was the, the who created these stated values, but I really like they generate fun connection and a healthy doses of anxiety. Uh, I love the healthy doses. I don't know if my anxiety is a healthy doses, but I, I think it will be present during my presentation because, well, you know, it's not my, my native language. So I really hope that this presentation uh, is for you something that contributes at least for generating new questions about our practice, yes? Um, well, but I would like to start with, with me, who I am. I am Fabian Olas. I am the, as I told you, I am the current president of the Argentinian ACBS chapter. I am also the president of CIPCO Foundation. That is an institute, a private institute the, uh, oriented to training and um, assistance of uh, clients in the field of contextual behavioral psychotherapies. I am also a researcher and professor 
at the University of Cordoba, and I am a FAP certified FAP trainer and peer reviewed ACVS Act trainer. I have two beautiful daughters, Valena and Pia. I have two dogs and a cat that maybe you will meet because she really likes contextual behavioral science. So she's always there in my back. Uh, I have, well, my wife, I am really happy with my wife, Gabby, and I live in Cordoba, it is the center of Argentina. And I am a psychotherapist, a supervisor. Yes, that is more or less who I am. And there are two other points that I would like to, to say about me. The first one is that I'm not an act therapist. I have to say that I'm not an act therapist anymore. And also that I'm not a fat therapist. And maybe you are thinking, how can I be a fat trainer and an act trainer without being a, an act psychotherapist or a fat therapist? Well, I don't know. Uh, it's something that is happening. But my idea is to present you why I am saying I'm not an act therapist, neither a fat therapist. Okay? And that will be my way of talking about clinical behavioral analysis. So let's start here. I don't know if you have heard about this um, current movement that has been called the age of processes. If you have heard about this, just raise your hand. So I don't, I will, I won't have too much time to talk about this. Okay, Marcel heard about this. Okay. Uh, Fabian, your uh, microphone is off. Yes, I get it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I will talk just a little bit about this situation that has been called the age of processes. Yes. Well, specifically, the idea is that in recent times, there has been a call to focus on psychological processes of change um, instead of um, keep on working in this strictly syndrome-based approach to human psychology. So the idea is to um, call for a new way of working or a new philosophy of doing psychotherapy more based on psychological processes of change instead of keep on working in the syndrome technique approach, yes? Uh, the main idea is that if we have the chance to find the main psychological processes or main mechanisms of change in psychotherapy, we are going to be able to work more precisely and more focused and obviously in a more effective way than if we keep on working in protocols that are orienting to, to symptoms and syndromes and that sometimes propose the same technique or the same approach to different psychopathologies uh, in a syndromic uh, based way. So just to be clear about what the process is, uh, we, we could start with this differentiation between procedures, outcomes, and processes. Okay, get it. I am receiving messages from Bartos. Okay, are you seeing my, my screen correctly now? Okay, perfect. So when we talk about processes, we are talking about the why of behavioral changes, the mechanism of change, yes, the, the, the mechanism that can explain how and why a client can move from a state A to a state B, yes? And it is different and also, well, also related to procedures because procedures are the how of behavioral change, the techniques or interventions we use 
yes, to move our clients from a state A to a state B. So the procedures and techniques are the how and the processes are the why, is how I can explain, yes, that this procedure or technique is working for, for this specific client. Yes. And finally, outcomes are the what of behavioral change. And outcomes will be what will tell us that we are achieving what we ought to do, we were uh, wanting to do. So outcomes are important in psychotherapy without any doubt, yes, are important because we are contextual, fun uh, functional contextual therapy. So we really care about effective or successful working. So we really care about goals, but they are not enough. We need to have outcomes. We are worried about outcomes in therapies, but also about how can I explain that these outcomes are reached or not? Yes, and these how I can explain are called processes. Yes, so the age of processes is basically a, a more focused interest in discovering or finding the why of behavioral change. Yes, what are the mechanisms that can explain the behavioral change? That's the idea, yes? So uh, when we are talking about the, the, the age of processes, we are talking basically about uh, a philosophy that is more interested in finding the why of, the, of behavioral change and not just to find the, the more effective treatment. So instead of empirically supported treatment packages defined by topography and linked to syndromes, we are seeing in this age of processes an increased interest in empirically supported mechanism or process linked to empirically supported procedures. So the idea is that this process-based philosophy allows or will allow therapists to identify mechanisms and how they present in your specific client, developing a formulation, a conceptual uh, formulation to explain how those mechanisms contribute to presenting problems. And in this way, we are able to select interventions that targets this mechanism through different stages of therapy. That is the main idea. So the invitation for clinicians and researchers is to uh, change our lenses in order to be more worried about processes than about techniques or procedures. The challenge here is that to develop this process-based approach, we have to cope with something that is really usual in our discipline is to agree what is or what is not a psychological process. Because it will depend, it will depend on your theoretical framework. So we, we have cognitive processes, we, we have behavioral processes, we can have uh, neurobiological processes depending on your point of view. So our first challenge here, if we are going to work with this process-based approach is to decide what kind of process will be useful for us in order to work with our clients. The good news, the good news is that if we are behaviorally oriented, I think we are simpler than other uh, clinicians. Because if we are behaviorally oriented, the term process will refer only to behavioral processes. Yes. And if we are talking about behavioral processes, we are talking about behavioral principles in a way. So we can say that we don't need to create a new philosophy because behaviorally philosophy or the philosophy of the analysis of behavior or behavioral analysis has been present with us since many years ago. 
So we can talk about radical behaviorism or we can talk about interbehaviorism. Um, so we can just keep on doing what we were doing and maybe just discuss how to be consistent with this philosophy or how to be consistent in following the principles that are there for us and our clients. So working in the age of processes as a behavioral therapy is just to be consistent with the principles or the processes of behavioral science. And when we do that, when we use the principles of behavioral science to work with our clients in session, spe specifically with our adult verbal clients in session, we are talking about clinical behavioral analysis. Yes. So clinical behavioral analysis is the application of the assumptions, principles, and methods of modern functional contextual behavioral analysis to traditional clinical issues. This quote that has been taken from Dogger and Hayes in the book, Clinical Behavioral Analysis, that is a really good book. I really recommend the, it for you. Uh, they refer to traditional clinical issues, to the typical problems, setting and issues that we confront as clinical psychologists working in outpatient settings and especially with verbal adults. Yes, and this uh, include the identification of the variables and processes that play a role in the development, maintenance and treatment of clinical disorders. Okay, now, now I think we are more able to um, understand what is clinical behavioral analysis. It's just a, a way of doing process-based therapy attending to behavioral processes or principles. So another way of saying this is that if I am a clinical behavioral analyst, I am basing my work in behavioral principles or assumptions, okay? And this will have some implication in our work. The first one is that our unity of analysis will be always the act in context. Yes. What this means is that I am just, I'm not just um, seeing behaviors. I'm always seeing behaviors in context, yes, as uh, inseparable events, yes, or this one. If B is behavior, A and C is context. So our unity, our, our unity of analysis will be always the A, B, and the C, not just the B, not just the behavior, but also what um, surrounds, surrounds behaviors. Specif specific, specifically speaking, we are interested also in the antecedents and antecedents and consequence that control or influence our behavior. Yes, I sometimes use this example. Yes, if you see me, yes, in the streets of your country doing this. What I am doing. It's a question for everyone. What I'm doing. That could be culturally specific, but if you see me, imagine that I am in your country in the street doing this. What I'm doing? Take a taxi, a bus, perfect. Signalizing, giving direction. Well, maybe I am a zombie. Yes, I am your brain. Yes, totally. And what if I am in, I don't know, a Nazi, event yes with the fury in the front in the front of me and i am doing this what i am doing
what would you say? Fabian is? Hi, main Führer, yes. Yeah. Or what if I am just coming back from my kinesiologist and I am in this way, what I am doing? Communicating maybe, or maybe I'm just have my arm really uh, like uh, with a lot of pain, yes. So as you can see something so simple as raising your hand will means totally different way things depending on the context. And that is the main assumption of doing clinical behavior analysis. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so behavior just can be well understood if we consider the events that are influencing behavior and that events are called context. So to talk about raising a hand, we need to consider raising the hand as a behavior in a context, because without the context, that behavior doesn't have any meaning for us. That is the first assumption. So clinical behavioral analysts, yes, need to think always human behavior in a context. That is our first assumption, yes. And that implies to think behavior considering antecedents and consequences as interactive events. That also means that we are more interested in functions over topography. In fact, the topography of raising my hand is the same. Yes, always the same in this example, but it means different stuff in different contexts. And it means the, the conceptual or the concept we use to talk, it means is functions. Yes. Raising my hand has different functions in different contexts. And we, as behavioral analysts, are more interested in functions over topography because the topography is always the same. I'm just raising my hand. But the function is different depending on the context. So if you start thinking about our client behavior, we are not so interested in the topography of our client behavior because it's the same behavior can have different functions in different contexts. For example, imagine a client who uh, really avoids shame. Yeah, let's think in terms of act. The more simple explanation of act, experiential avoidance. Yes, we imagine a client who really avoid experiencing shame. Yes, so in his or her daily life, he avoids uh, avoid having intimate conversation with his girlfriend or her girlfriend or his boyfriend or her boyfriend, yes. And in session, he or she usually uh, makes a lot of jokes every time the, the therapist try to talk about intimate issues. Yes, with, with his or her couple, he avoids the conversation with the therapist, he makes jokes. Yes. Topographically, we are talking about different behavior because in one, in one context, the clients just avoid having conversations, for example, in saying, I don't want to talk about this. And with the therapist, he makes jokes. So we are talking about different behavior with the same functions. Yes. Or we can talk about the same behavior with different functions. For example, making jokes. I can make jokes for avoiding shame. I can, I can make jokes for connecting with you as, as the participants of this uh, class or this conference. I can make jokes for 
um, I don't know, um, decreasing the, the emotional arousal in one of my clients. So I can do the same behavior with different functions. And that allow us to think about behavior in a much more flexible way. Yes. So we are interested in functions over topography. So we all explain a behavior by appealing to its function. So one of our main questions as clinical behavioral analysts is what is the function? What is the function of this behavior in this context? Yep. And the other implication is that we can work with many behavior with the same functions. So we can imagine that our client comes to therapy, comes to therapy because he or she has problems. Yes. And these problems are a family of behaviors that maybe have the same function. We have many ways of, for example, avoiding shame, avoiding fear, many ways of following rules rigidly, many ways of uh, struggling with ourselves. Yes. So we can say that our clients come to therapy with a family of behavior that sometimes shares functions. And what we try to do through behavioral principles is to create a context for new behavior to show up. Some alternative behavior that can be also a family. Yep. So if I am a clinical behavioral analyst, I have the, 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 this work in front of me. I, I'm invited to use behavioral principles to move my client from a context when he is, or it's, his behavior is controlled by a context and his behavior is problematic in a way to a new context when new behavior or alternative behavior will appear. That's my main task. And it doesn't matter about the topography. What I am trying to change is the functions that control this behavior. Okay. Another implication is that we work in two main arenas. Yes. I use this metaphor that is used, frequently used by my friend Niklas Tornicki because I think it's really clear to talk about two main arenas. The main arena or the first arena is the daily life of our clients. They experience problem in their daily lives. Yes, that's why they are in therapy. Yes, it's the main arena. But the therapist doesn't have control or influence in that arena. The therapist just have control and influence in one arena that is the session context. Yes, we just work one hour, sometimes more or less one hour in one week with a client that has a whole life the rest of the time. So the two arenas are the outside of therapy and the inside of therapy. And the behavioral analyst, the clinical behavioral analyst just can work with what happened inside therapy. We usually use this uh, code, the out, outer behavior and the inner behavior. In fact, we use the CRV1 when we are talking about problems inside therapy and out or O1 when we are talking about outside problems. And we talk or we use the, 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 the concept of CRV2, yes, improvements inside therapy and O2 for improvements outside therapy. And if we put all this concept together, we could say that a clinical behavioral analyst tried to create a context for moving 
CRV1 into CRV2 inside therapy, and then to create a context that can allow the client to generalize the improvements in on his or her daily life. So it's like we are working in a behavioral lab. The client comes into our lab, lab with problems outside with O1. We create a context in session for evoking new useful behavior. And when that happened, we create a bridge between the inside therapy to the outside therapy to generalize the, this new repertoire. Are we okay up to now? So far, so good? Perfect. So this way of working, yes, when we consider psychotherapy as a context for client behavioral change, leads the behavioral therapist or lead us into a more complete consideration of the therapist client relationship. So if I am a clinical behavioral analyst, I will be really sensitive of the functions that are present inside therapy. That can explain why when we work in clinical behavioral analysis, we work in really emotional intense environment inside therapy. Yes, because we have to be really attuned with what is happening in the clean client therapist interaction, because these functions are maybe equivalent to the function that control our client behavior outside therapy. So we assume that there is some kind of functional equivalence between the outside and the outside, the inside and the outside. So, and it's a kind of paradox, but we are really eager of seeing problematic behavior of our clients happening inside therapy. We, we really expect that because if we can see our therapy, our, excuse me, our client doing what he or she usually does outside therapy in terms of problems, we have the chance to create a context for alternative behavior. And then to generalize a new repertoire to the outside. So we are a kind of partner or classmate in the lab, yes? And our main goal is to help our client to move from a CRV1 to a CRV2, and then to generalize the CRV2 as an O2. That is our dance. And we have to be really sensitive because we have to identify when our client is doing what he or she is supposed to do. Yes, problems with us. Okay. Okay, I will uh, try to, to answer your questions after this presentation or maybe in some a specific slide when I feel that we are just like developing the point of view. So don't worry, I will consider your question, Luciano. But up to now, what is what we have? Well, that we, the clinical behavioral analysts, use the behavioral principles to help our clients to move from a state one to a state two. And the state one, we can name that state as a problem to a state two that we can name is as an alternative repertoire, yes. And the way we do that is working inside session. That is the context where we have much more influence on behavior, yes. So the problems happening in session, we can call it CRV1, clinical behavior, clinical, rela um, clinical related behavior, Oh, excuse me, clinical relevant behavior inside yes, the session. And because we are talking about problems, we are talking a CRV1. 
And the idea is to create the context for CRV2 to appear, to happen. I mean, clinically relevant behavior improvements, and then to generalize that in the daily life of our, of our clients. And we have some tools in our toolbox. And these tools, because we are working inside behavioral analysis, analysis are behaviorally oriented intervention. Basically, we are talking about elicit respondent behavior like emotions, thoughts, evoking operant behavior like naming emotions, sharing emotions, asking or whatever operant behavior you are thinking about that can be an improvement. In the case of our uh, joker client, maybe an improvement, improvement would be to talk about shame and not using jokes as a way of, of avoiding the conversation with the therapist so the therapist can evoke in the client talking about shame. For example, and say, okay, I am seeing that you are again doing jokes. I really wonder what are you feeling right now behind that joke? Can you tell me a little bit more what you are experiencing right now? Would be an example of uh, intervention oriented to evoke approximation instead of avoidance, for example. And when we have the alternative repertoire, in this case, our client is talking about shame, what would the therapist do if you know something about behavioral analysis? What would the therapist or what is expected to do by the therapist? What do you think? I have the new repertoire inside, inside the session in front of me. My client is not using joke, is talking about shame. What should I do? What do you think? Let me see chat. Reinforce it totally. So I have to do anything in order to maintain that behavior or even increase that behavior for generalizing them to the daily life. Yep. And what is to reinforce is to do something, anything that can increase the probability of the new behavior to maintain or to increase. Yes, and obviously that is functionally defined. It's not just to say, great, you are talking about shame. It's to find something that can increase this probability in this specific client. Yes. Obviously, there are some basic behavior that we as a therapist can do. For example, validating. It's saying, okay, I can see that it's really, really hard for you to talk about shame. And I can see that is something that you are doing. How do you feel about that, for example? Just an example. But we have to reinforce the new behavior repertoire and then to work on generalizing and discriminating context where the client can practice this new repertoire and also context or, or helping the clients to identify the context where this new behavior won't be reinforced outside. That is more or less our dance. So what kind of problem we are, we are able to work inside clinical behavioral analysis? Any problem in the outside life of our clients? Yes, because remember, we are not talking about topography. We are talking about functions. For example, if I have a client who had some kind of problem with drugs, I'm not saying that I have to create the context for the client to take drug, drugs inside the therapy's room. I am talking about creating a context for making more probable that a functional equivalent behavior can happen inside therapies. For example, talking about drugs or for example, I don't know, um, 
scratching the, the skin when some kind of craving is elicited inside of therapy. So I can work with any kind of problem that happened outside. Yes. If I have the, the tools to create a context for some equivalent behavior can happen inside therapies. Room. That's okay. Well, the first difference between elicit and evoking, and that's the difference that some uh, behavioral analysts use and some doesn't use, is that we elicit respondent behavior and we evoke operant behavior. Speaking really simply, it's like we elicit non-voluntary behavior and we evoke voluntary behavior. I elicit shame, I elicit, or a situation elicits shame, I don't know, um, memories or physical sensations. And I evoke speaking about that I evoke asking things. I evoke awareness of what I am feeling, for example. That's the main difference, Carl. Yes. But don't worry about this because some behavioral analysts use the term evoke, evoke for both. I usually differentiate just because I think it's pragmatically, sometimes it's simply for my students to uh, understand why, what, what we are doing inside therapy. Yes. Okay, so far so good up to now. Okay, perfect. So if we put all this stuff in our clinical table, we can say that the clinical behavioral analysts do or does the following tasks. First of all, it then identifies a problematic class of behavior happening in session or evokes it, yes? If my client is really struggling with shame, I have to do something for shame to happen inside therapy to see what is the behavior of the client after this inner antecedent was elicited in session. And both two things could happen. One is the problematic behavior and the other one is the alternative behavior. That's okay. So the therapist asks the client if the behavior previously detected as problematic is occurring in session. That's the second step. So in our client, the therapist could say, okay, I am seeing you right now, bladdered that you are doing some jokes. I, I really wonder if you are right now experiencing some shame because maybe that is present too. And Vladut can say, yep, I am experiencing some shame. So we have already done the second step. We identify the problematic behavior in session. So we can do the third step. Once the problematic behavior and their controlling variables have been identified, we proceed to the intervention itself, which involves evoking an alternative repertoire. Yep. In this case, would could be in the example, okay, let's talk about you, your shame without jokes, because for me, it's a really serious issue. Your emotion for me really matter. So imagine that the client starts opening to these experiences inside therapies. We have to do the fourth step. Once the alternative repertoire become more frequent, we proceed to generalize and discrimination training. Yes. Let's suppose the clients open really in a really vulnerable way about his or her struggle, about how difficult it is for, he, for him or for her to live struggling with shame, how far 
he or she is feeling from other people and he or she does it in the middle of a lot of shame with the therapist. So the therapist does whatever he can do in terms of the, the, the case conceptualization, but maintain this new behavior and increase it, so reinforce it. Now the task is to generalize, maybe with some kind of homework or practice in uh, between sessions or whatever we can use to improve or to evoke generalization. And also he can work, the therapist can work with the client uh, to identify contexts that can be trouble uh, punishing for this new repertoire. That would be more or less a dance. That is the clinical behavioral dance, yes. And that is what I mostly do every session with every of my clients. Yes, that's my dance. Yep. But wait, we have one more problem here. And the problem is the following. Human suffering is verbal. So the core process must be verbal and also behaviorally defined. What I'm trying to say is that we suffer, my dog suffers, my cat suffers, but we suffer in a different fashion. My dog suffers because he is hungry or he's tired or he is, I don't know, with some, some stomach pain or something like that. And I suffer because the pain I had many years ago, the pain I could have in the future, the pain that I expect someone will make me suffer and many other events that are not in the current event, uh, environment are created by this beautiful tool we have that is called language. So the new challenge we have is that we need to explain what language is if we agree with this assumption that suffering is verbal in human beings. Are you following me up to now? Because the, this is the most fun place to, to, to do therapy. It's not just to do the dance, it's to do this dance considering that what is influencing my, be, my behavior and my client behavior is mostly verbal. So we need a theory to explain what language is, and it must be a behaviorally oriented theory. And we have theories, and one of the most respected theory among the theories of language, behavioral oriented theories of language that we have today is R of T. So, R of T allow me to think about all these dance we were talking about, but considering a special kind of behavior we have and my dog doesn't, that is called language. Yes. But if I am a behavioral analyst or I want to be a behavioral analyst, I need to talk about language or as a behavior, or either as a behavior or as a context. Because if you remember, behavioral analysts are interested in act in context or behavior in context. So if I want to work with language from the inside of this point of view, I should consider language either as a behavior or as a context or both. Are you with me right now? So we can say, we could say, or could we say that language is a behavior? 
Yes, we could. Yes, we could say that language is a behavior and it's a behavior or a behavioral repertoire based on evolution. A repertoire, basically a repertoire that was useful for survival. Yes, because it allowed us to give coherence but making the world more predictable and to interact with the world in a way that allow us to be here right now. I'm in Argentina, you in many part of the world through a computer. So why my dog is right now in the sun outside my home? Yes. So we have a great tool for survival, but it's also the tool that allow us to suffer verbally, yes, or to suffer more than my dog. So this repertoire, basically from, a, from an RFT point of view, consists on building or deriving relations between events, yes, arbitrarily, what that means is that I can relate everything with everything, yes, because I have this repertoire. I can say that a pink dinosaur is older than a white elephant. And it makes sense for you, even when the dinosaur or the elephant don't exist. So I have this repertoire. I was trained by the Brava community on this repertoire. And this repertoire allow us to relate everything with everything and to respond to relations. Yes. So you can say that I am Fabian and it makes sense. Yes. And when after this conference, someone asks you, what was the guy that talked about clinical behavioral analysis names? You will say Fabian and maybe you will see my, my, my face. That could be aversive or repetitive. It depends on the function for you. So we have that skill and that skill allow us to survive, but also to suffer verbally. So the way we verbally organize the war influence the way we respond to it. That is the main assumption of RFT. So we can relate in a way that is useful for us or in a way that can make us live in a really problematic way. So once we learn to language the world, yes, because language is a behavior that can be trained and learned, that's the way we learn. We use language for everything. We relate everything with everything. So language start influencing our behavior. So we can say that language is also a context. So that is for good or for bad. Because, because of language, we are able to sidestep immediate gratification. And maybe, I don't know in your countries, but here we are on lunch time, I am not eating my lunch, I am postponing my gratification in order to be here with you. So thanks language for that. Yes. So I can go for long term consequences too. So I can delay my gratification in order to uh, reach like more distant goals or long term consequences. Yes. And that is useful. Yes. And that is one of the uh, good point of the like side of language. But we can also suffer because of that. Why? Because, because we re learn early to relate stimuli, yes, in this particular way, relationally and arbitrarily. We can change the way antecedents and consequence influence in our behavior. So imagine that you are really thirsty and you have a glass of water in, the fr in front of you. Yes. If we wouldn't have language, 
we will just do what my dog do, what my, my dog does, drink water. But because we have language, we can see the glass of water, we can think, okay, that water would be good or is maybe contaminated. And imagine that a friend says, take care because Pedro who has coronavirus has drunk from that glass some minutes ago. So even when I am thirsty, even when I have a glass of, of water in front of me, I won't drink because verbal context is transforming the functions of the glass, this glass of water in something that can be aversive for me. So can you see how language alterates the whole ABC stuff? It's like, it's like it doesn't matter what the antecedent is because it can be anything because we have language. And the same with C with consequences, yes? Because maybe I drink the water and I feel some relief, but also I can start thinking, oh my God, now I have coronavirus. Yes, so the relief just stopped to give some space for new suffering, verbal suffering. So now that we have language, we are in a new world, in a verbal world with many functions that go much farther than the physical functions or the intrinsic, intrinsic functions of the events. So responses of the behaving, behaving person can acquire complex antecedent functions and maybe become self-instructions telling us what to do and for what purposes. And the responses can also be controlled by abstract or overarching verbal constructions that can acquire reinforcing or punishing functions. And it doesn't matter of the physical events. What matters is the way I am relating the world. And that will influence in our behavior for the good or for the bad. Because this skill also explain human suffering. That is what we call the dark side of language or the dark side of the force. Our ability to follow self-instruction, our ability to respond verbally to the world can also lead us to vicious circles. For example, unsuccessful persistence. When we persist in a, in a way, even when the whole reality is telling us that it is not working. But well, we hope it will be sometime. So we start doing things in a persistent fashion, even when we are making contact with unsuccessful consequences. The main, the best example is experiential avoidance. So my client is making jokes, is avoiding uh, having intimate conversation with his wife, even when he is noticing that it's not working. Why? Because he is responding verbally to his world, both the outer world and the inner world, because shame is part of our inner world. Does it make sense? So now that we have language, we have new problems. Yes, we have new possibilities, but also new problems, yes. And this new problem is that because of language, we can interact verbally with the world and also with ourselves. So maybe my life is working really well and at the same time, I think I am a fraud or I think I'm not, I'm not good enough or I really feel 
I'm just a piece of crap. Yes. And it doesn't matter that my, my life look really well from the outside. Yes. Because I have language and I can create this new world of suffering. Yes, because I have language, I can relate in a problematic fashion with myself and with my own behavior. And what is experiential avoidance if it is not a problematic way of interacting with our own behavior? So, speaking simply, sticky words and sticky stories make us feel stuck. And we have to consider that if we want to work with human suffering. So that implies that our clinical task will include identifying the problematic class of behavior or evoking it, asking the client if the behavior previously detected as problematic is happening in session, doing the intervention itself that is evoking a new repertoire and reinforcing that. And we can do that through the verbal context too. So the idea is that we can use our clinical conversation to do these steps. And we can do this with problems that are controlled by the verbal context. Yes. So that implies that we can create or evoke a useful verbal context that will be useful because we'll evoke an alternative repertoire and we can do our work to weaken a useful verbal context or context that evokes problematic behavior. Yep, and we can do it through exercises, through the clinical conversation, or, well, creativity is the limit for that. So we are not saying that because we are working with human suffering, we have to resign to, to, to dance this dance. We are saying that we can do it, we can do it even with verbal behavior and verbal context. So I can evoke or imagine I can elicit shame just talking about situations that where you feel ashamed, for example. Or we can evoke, yes, an alternative behavior just asking for that. And we can reinforce a new behavior without thinking about concrete events. We can reinforce just evoking some specific relations between your behavior and something that is meaningful for you. Well, in, in the way we do, we do that in act, for example, when we work with values, I can just frame your behavior in hier hierarchy with what is most important for you or some qualities of action. So I can reinforce using verbal context too. Or I can work with the problematic way you are interacting with your own behavior and with yourself, yes? Creating a context for an alternative response. And that context will be verbal too. And I'm still working inside clinical behavioral analysis. And that is not something new. In fact, this quote of Skinner is saying the same thing. Skinner says in about behaviorism that the person who has been made aware of himself by the question he has been asked is in a better position to predict and control his own behavior. So yes, we suffer verbally, but also the therapist can use language to weaken problematic functions of language and to create a new verbal context to promote a better life for our clients. 
and we can do it verbally. In fact, it's what we do. So I will stop here and I can work with your questions. And then I have a short exercise to present you. So you can see from the inside out some of these principles. Thanks for your applause. Okay, if you have a question, I'm here for you. If you don't have, oh, thank you, Alison. Alison, you are the Alison that is my class classmate in the course. I think you are. Yes, I'm card too. Okay, is it a book from Tomisi relevant? I'm sorry, confused. Well, I think Marcel that is it is relevant because the book, I think I have the book here. Uh, is a Dogger and Hayes book. Uh, has two or three chapters where the main point of view is presented. So I think it's a great book. And I will take the most of this presentation to uh, share with you that uh, Emily Sandons, Sandos and me, well, we are working on a new book that is like um, based on some new uh, developments inside clinical behavior analysis. Uh, we expect to have it in maybe next year, but we are working on that. And I will take the opportunity to share with you that we have, you have uh, the ACBS CBA seek so you have the chance to know more people that are interested in, on this point of view and it's part of the ACBS uh, and Emily Sandos is the the president of the silk so you have another possibility there but well the, the answer and Marcel is I think it is still relevant you have many chapters where you can uh, take some general principles that are useful in fact I prepared this class with some chapter of that book. Well, Carl said modeling is evoking. In fact, if we have to talk about the main principles of uh, behavioral modification or procedures, we could say that modeling is a procedure, yes, and as exposure is a procedure, as well, contingent management is a procedure. So modeling would be a, a procedure that can be really useful to evoke behavior without any doubt, but also to elicit, elicit because imagine that I am like showing my client that I can talk about my shame without making jokes. Maybe that could elicit some shame in my client or guilt, uh, or also can evoke that the client said, I don't know. Well, you can do it because you are the therapist. I'm, I'm not. So that's the interesting stuff because you can do whatever you want, but you will elicit or evoke behavior that you don't know that can happen. But in fact, I can use modeling without any doubt as an intervention procedure. Yes. yes. In the behavioral principle that Alvis Bandura supposed that was behind modeling was the vicarious learning. Yes, that's the, the, the behavioral principle. But in fact, we can say that the behavior, the vicarious learning would be the process and modeling would be the procedure. I don't know if I was clear enough, Carl. And it's nice, nice to see you here. It's also a classmate. Okay. Do you have any more questions? We have, because I have a short game for you. And it's a really nice game that I learned with Kevin Polk some years ago and uh, with Benji Schwender some years ago. And it's a play that I usually work with my clients because obviously I won't present all this conceptual stuff to my clients. But I have also to create some, some kind of psychoeducation about what we are going to work in our process. So how can I explain 
the importance of function, the importance of context, and the importance of discriminating, yes, to a client. Yes, it's virtually impossible. So what I usually do, or one of the tools I use as part of my toolbox to do this dance with my clients is called the act matrix. But for me, it's the matrix because I use it uh, inside clinical behavioral analysis, not just for act purposes. So just to do this short practice and following Skinner quotes that a person who has been made aware of himself by the question he has been asked is in a better position to predict and control his own behavior. I will ask you some general questions. So the invitation is to write in a piece of paper your answer to my questions and then we can talk about it. So the first question is who or what is important for you? Who or what is most important for you right now? Just write five things at the top. Could be persons, could be people, or could be something that is meaningful for you. In fact, it is an evoking question I use with my clients. Okay, tell me now what is most important for you or who is most important for you today, right now. Okay, Vanina, my son, my daughter, my husband, my job, my course is perfect. Okay. Now, creating lasting relationships. Thanks, Bartos. Okay, that's perfect. If you want, you can share here in the chat. If you don't want, you can just share this with you. Because I have another question. Let's suppose that you don't usually live a life 100% consistent with these things you identify as really meaningful for you. Let's suppose that there are obstacles. In fact, for me, my mother is really important and I'm not able to be with her because she's in another state, so I am far from her, so I don't have the chance to be with her. And it's an obstacle, yes. But I have also inner obstacles. For example, the, the thought, Oh, maybe tomorrow. I will call her tomorrow. Or, well, I will have time to call her in some time. But I don't know because in this crazy world, maybe my mother could die tomorrow. So for me, that thought can be an obstacle. Or maybe shame. I have some shame to talk to her because I, I didn't for a long time. So now the second question is, what are your most difficult inner obstacles. And when I am talking about inner obstacles, I am talking about emotions, thoughts, sensations that usually arise when you are moving toward what is most important for you. Just choose your top five. In my case today, I would say that my most difficult inner experience is maybe this kind of self-judgmental thoughts, like you are 
to fraud, you are doing a really bad job, you are not enough, and all this stuff. But you can choose your own. Now, the following question is, what do you usually do when these this difficult experiences show up? And you can do many things to avoid them, to control them, or just to follow what they are ordering you. For example, when I am buying the thoughts, I am a fraud or I am not enough, I'm not good enough, I ask for reassurance to people. Or I wait for reassurance. Or I avoid to do presentations in English, for example. So choose your favorite behaviors. Have you identified some of them? At least one. Okay. Now I have another question. You have on one side, what is most important for you. On the other side, you have the inner obstacles. You have on one side, the things you do when these inner obstacles govern your behavior or control your behavior. And I, my question is, what do you usually do to move toward what is most important for you? For example, for me, my mother is really important. So a toward move would be to call her by phone. So now identify some behaviors that move or could move you toward what you have identified as the most important things for you. Okay, thanks, Bartos. Bartos said, I try to surround myself with like-minded people. I like that. I try to do the same. And maybe that's why I'm here. Even when I am thinking I'm a fraud, or I'm afraid of or everything. And now I have the last question. Well, the last question is, what do you usually do to move toward what is most important for you? Or what did you usually do some years ago and you are not doing it anymore, but there are still toward moves? Or what would do the person you would like to be to move toward what is most important for you? I have I have not already called my mother, but I think the person I want to be would be the guy who called his mother to know how she is. Okay, great Saul, being here studying, perfect. So you are doing right now, great job. And now I have the last question. Who is the only one, who is the only person who can identify what is most important for him or for her? Who can identify their most difficult inner obstacles? Who is the one who can identify what if what he or she is doing is a, an away move or a toward move? Who is the one? Who is the only one? Me. That's the only answer. Myself. 
So you are the one who can choose what to do, even in the presence of this yucky stuff. You are the one who can choose to move toward or away in your life. But that is something that can be learned. And my work with you, that is the way I present to my clients, will be to train you or we will train together to move toward the life you want to live. And we are going to do it working with what happened inside therapy because all your problems in the outside, I'm sure will be here in the inside. That's why I will ask you again and again, is this happening right now with me? That will be my question because I'm sure that this will be your love for learning any way of living. That would be my psychoeducation. And the question I usually do this diagram that is the matrix, it's called the matrix. So if you want, you can put your who or what is important in these quadrants. Yes, let me see, I will take my notes here. Here, you can put your inner obstacles here. You can put your away behaviors here and your toward behavior here. And now you can think what of these, which of these two ways of living were you living in the last two years? A life focused on inner obstacles and struggling with yourself or a life focused on cultivating what is most important for you. And you can also think that this is the O1, this is the O2. And if something of this is happening inside therapy, yes, we can say that this is a CRV1, this is a CRV2, and it is a CRV2 too, because noticing is a verbal repertoire that is the base of our work being aware of ourselves. That is more or less my work. And that is more or less the way I present to my clients. If you are thinking about, well, and functions, well, you have here the functions, appetitive, aversive. And the context, well, you have the external context here, and you have the inner context here that is controlling our behavior. That is more or less the idea. So, I told you that can happen in session. Would you like to, to see how a client is in session when the client is mostly in the left side of the matrix and how a client is or looks like when he is or she is in the right side of the matrix. It looks like something like this. Yes. It looks closed, struggling with himself or struggling with whatever is happening in the session or he or she is open, exploring with curiosity. So the way I usually try to identify the functions in session is remembering this. Living a life focused on struggling with yourself is living a life in an aversive context. Is living a life that is focused on surviving, not on living. If I am working with a CRV2, it usually looks like something that is opening, that is increasing, that will have more details, more exploration, more freedom in terms of Skinner. So some concluding words, just some. 
why I told you that I am not an act therapist and I'm not a fat therapist because clinical behavior analysis embraced a broad range of therapeutic methods ranging from the interpretation of hidden meanings to emotional acceptance. And it also offers a theoretical basis for the integration of psychotherapy in general. So I really hope that the future would be a one model future of therapy. I know that I won't be living when, if this happened, but it's something that guide my work. That's what I don't feel really comfortable saying that I am a fab therapist, I am an act therapist. No, I think I am a CBA therapist, a clinical behavior analyst. And I think that that allowed me to release myself for theoretical dresses and to be open to integrate different, different interventions, yes, based on behavioral principles. So, I am talking about the future, what I would expect, I would like in the future to happen in our discipline. But if I am saying that, I have to talk just shortly about something that I think we like many of the people eat here with me right now because we are classmates in a course that talk about this. Yes. If I have to talk about the future, I have to come back to the unity of analysis because we are currently living some kind of theoretical debate about what would be the, uni the unity of analysis in clinical behavioral analysis. In fact, we have many people who still think that the ABC is still the, the most useful unity of analysis, but we also have people that is working about changing the unity of analysis into something that is verbally uh, oriented or is more related with the way we relate or we interact with the world that is verbally. So now we have what was called the PBBT point of view, process-based behavior, behavioral therapy that was created by Yvonne Barnes Holm and Chiara McEntengart and it's basically a theoretical approach or a behavioral approach derived from RFT developments. And they are proposing that we should change the ABC unit of analysis into the row aiming unit of analysis. It's just a curiosity just to show you what, what is the, the way I am working today. But I would say again that I am not a PPPT therapist yet because that is the the path that i am really enjoying right now and i think it's more consistent with my point of view so i would say that i am a clinical behavior analyst that is exploring with curiosity in my side right side of my matrix pbbt and that would be the end of my presentation just i want to show you some of my more recent books, if you want to explore. Well, the, the two last, uh, you are going to learn some Spanish first, but if you like to learn Spanish and to learn a little bit about clinical behavioral analysis in the way we did it today, I recommend you to buy the Las Tormentas de Blas because it's a children book with many designs. and uh, It's really easy to understand. Uh, it's one of my favorites because Blas was my dog. He taught me about simplicity. He taught me about the way I suffer and how different is the way he suffered. He taught me about how important it is to be simple and not to think in a really complex and ambitious ways. And I think that is what I found in clinical behavioral analysis. So Blas is always part of my presentations, yes because he taught me how important it is to be simple. And that's one of the main reasons why I am working in clinical behavior analysis, because I don't need too many principles. It's just parsimony. Yes. And that's what I really like. Because the simple things can give us the greatest happiness, my friends.
Okay, so let's live our life with dog eyes and let's start to be Pablo's friends. Yeah. Here you have my contact information. I really like to have friends. I really like to be near to people who are interested in what I am interested. So feel free to write me or to visit my site. Uh, just to finish, I want to thank again Bartos because I know how difficult it is to organize, to do the schedule. And sometimes when you made the schedule, some of the presenters couldn't be there and all this stuff and it's really stressing, but Bartos, as you can see, is like a Buddha. He's always center anchor. So I'm really glad to be here. That is more or less what I have. Thank you very much, Fabian, for the, for the lecture which uh, concludes today's conference. Uh, just let me know, uh, Luciana asked a question before. Uh, have you responded to it? About No, I didn't. So could you... Uh... Yes, I, I will read it to you. Um, so Luciana asked, uh, why not take the clinical behavior analysis to the client's natural environment, like community psychology, for example? I presume uh, the context was to catch the right function of it, to analyze it uh, uh, well enough. Well, I think it, it is part of our work. In fact, the main difference between behavioral analysis and clinical behavioral analysis, one of the main differences is the setting when we work, but it doesn't exclude uh, the usual settings where the behavioral analysis analyst works. So obviously community settings, residents, uh, resident settings, residential settings, or all the settings that uh, usually a behavioral analyst work are included. We talk about clinical behavioral analysis because our setting is inside the office, but it doesn't exclude other uh, settings to work. Uh, and again, when I am doing therapy with my clients, I can also work in uh, changing the environment. I work also with DBT. I think Bartos, you work DBT too. Uh, we work sometimes with uh, family or with uh, parents. Uh, so uh, when we talk about clinical problems, we are not saying that we are not able to work with uh, external context, but most of our interventions will happen inside the office. I don't know if, if I am clear enough, Bartos, if if not, you tell me.